Hello and welcome back to Fourier Transform, the video series where we talk about so-called Fourier series and the continuous Fourier transform. And in order to do that, we really have to talk about integrable functions in today's part 5. Integrals play a crucial role in this theory and today we will define the corresponding spaces. However, before we start with these definitions, you already know, I first want to thank all the nice people who support this channel on Steady, here on YouTube or via Patreon. And by using any of these platforms, you get access to the additional material for all the videos. If you want to know more, just click the link in the description. Okay, then I would say, let's immediately start by recalling our set of functions that are 2 pi periodic. They should be defined on the real number line, but the output can be a complex number. More precisely, this means we consider functions f from r to c with the property that they will not change the output if we shift the input by 2 pi. And there you already know, these functions are the ones we want to approximate with cosine and sine functions, or more concretely with the trigonometric polynomials. These we can denote with p and they form a subspace in the space f. And you know from the last videos that this subspace is given by the span of these functions. The only thing that changed here is that we also allow for complex scalars. And now please recall, on the span, on the subspace, we have a very nice inner product. For this video here, we can ignore the constant in front and we see Essentially, this inner product is given by an integral. And now if we want to use that for the approximation of 2 pi periodic functions, we have to restrict ourselves to integrable functions. And this is exactly the next step. We go to integrable functions, so we consider another subspace in F. And usually we denote that space by L1. However, also here, we just want to consider 2 pi periodic functions. So in other words, we have the same functions f from before, but with an additional condition. And the property we want here is that f is integrable. More precisely, we want to be able to integrate over one period. And as we have chosen it before, we can say that we integrate from minus pi to pi. And now if we put in the absolute value of f of x, then this integral should be finite. So this is exactly what we want to have here. The integral of the absolute value makes sense. Now, at this point, I have to say a little bit more here, because in order to understand what is happening now, we need some integration theory. If it's just for calculation reasons, you can definitely see this integral as an ordinary Riemann integral, as we have learned it in real analysis. However, to be able to work nicely with these spaces here, so for the theory, we need Lebesgue integration. Therefore, what we have actually hidden here is that f is integrable with respect to the Lebesgue measure. More concretely, the Lebesgue measure on the interval minus pi to pi. Now, if you know some measure theory, this is not a problem for you and you also know that we have to fix a sigma algebra here. However, I don't want to go into the details here, because I have a whole measure theory course about that. And as I have already told you, here it's totally okay to think of the Riemann integral and just accept that we can extend the whole thing to a nice space. But if you are interested in more details, you can definitely check out my measure theory series. The result we get and need here is that this L1 is a nice vector space as before. The scalar multiplication and the addition are the same as in our vector space f. And now the first thing we want to add to the vector space is a so-called norm. And now obviously a good candidate would be to take the integral again. This is usually what we call the one norm of f. By definition we already know it's a finite number and for sure it's not negative. However, it has a little problem because it's not positive definite. This is easy to see if you just look at an example. And for the example, we can just consider the interval minus pi to pi. And now imagine such a function that jumps at some points. But if you ignore the jump points, 
it would be just the zero function. In other words, this function has norm zero, but it's not the zero function. The problem is simply that the integral cannot see such small changes here. Hence our result here is that this nice thing here is sadly not a norm on our L1 space. However, there is a nice standard solution for exactly this problem here. And I can already tell you, we just need to take an equivalence relation and a quotient space. So the idea is simply that this function we sketched here should be equivalent to the zero function. And then in the end, we don't use the functions, but the equivalence classes of the functions. And I say that this is a standard solution for such a problem, because that's what we do when we construct the number sets as well. So for example, we use an equivalence class to construct the integers coming from the natural numbers. Therefore, this whole procedure here should not be a surprise for you, because this is what mathematicians do. So now more precisely, two functions f and g are called equivalent if the integral of the difference is equal to zero. And as always, measured with the absolute value inside. So you could say, if we take the function f and change it on a set that the integral cannot see, then the result is equivalent to f. And then what we get in the end is the set of all equivalence classes usually denoted with such a quotient. And now it's not hard to see that this result gives us a complex vector space again. And this one we also denote with L1, but now we don't use the curved L anymore. So you could say this is now the actual vector space we want to have. And now the good thing is that here we actually have a norm now. The only thing we have to do is to define the norm of an equivalence class now. And this is not so hard. If f lies in the equivalence class, we just define it by using the norm of f. And this is well defined, because if we take another function from the equivalence class, we already know that they coincide in the integral sense. Or more precisely, the only difference happens on a set with measure 0. Therefore, the value of the integral that comes out here will be the same. So what we get is that this new object is positive definite, and we can also check the other norm properties. So what we have is that this rigid L1 is a complex vector space with a norm. And now in the last step, what one usually does is an identification with the functions we already know. This means we have the theory of the equivalence classes here, but usually in calculations, we will forget about this and just calculate with the ordinary functions. And in that sense, we also say that the trigonometric polynomials are a subspace in L1. Of course, in order to make this literally true, we have to go to equivalence classes here on the right as well. However, since this is not a problem, one usually does not write down this step at all. We simply say that we identify functions with equivalence classes here. Okay, so there we have it. Now we have a function space we can work with where the trigonometric polynomials form a subspace. But now you might ask, we still did not extend the inner product we have on the trigonometric polynomials here. However, this is just an extension of what we have already did with L1 here. Indeed, it just means that now we have to go to so-called square integrable functions. And there you might already know, this is what we denote by the L2 space. And the only difference from before is now that we claim that the absolute value squared inside the integral still gives us a finite integral. So everything is the same as in L1, we just have a stronger additional condition here. And in fact, this leads to a different norm we usually call the L2 norm. And this should not be a surprise for you. For the definition, we take the integral with the square inside. However, since a norm has to be positive homogeneous, we need to take the square root of the whole thing. Okay, but then by this definition, you know we can do the same definitions as before. So we take an equivalence relation and then define the L2 space. And then what we get is the L2 norm, which is related to an inner product. So the result is we get a complex vector space together with an inner product. And there, we already know, orthogonal projections make sense. 
And this is exactly what we will do in the next video, because we want to do an orthogonal projection onto this subspace here. This will be the approximation, what we call the Fourier series. So let's meet in the next video and have a nice day. Bye bye.